Good morning. Let's uh, pray before I begin. Father, we thank you so much that you have made your word free and available for us to read and obey. Today is at yet another one of the things that you want us to do. We pray, Lord, that you will open our hearts and minds. You will bless us to be attentive. And uh, you will transform our hearts to become a little more like you as we go from here and be changed more into your likeness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The, when he, Jesus was asked about what is the most important commandment, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Is this on? Is it on? And uh, with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. So that's what we're going to look at today. But before we begin, I want to tell you that a few months ago, uh, I had a very bad catch in my neck. So bad that I couldn't breathe. You know, it was radiating down the arm and uh, it was like the nerves were so sh you know sharp that i couldn't breathe so i had to go somewhere but i just couldn't make myself get out of the bed because there was so much of pain and uh, i te teach some students at home so one of the students came home and uh, he says miss why are you looking so terrible i said i'm in such terrible pain the pain is shooting down he says miss you know when i get a pain like this my mother has shown me that there is an acupressure point here just below the thumb. And if you find a spot which is really, really painful and press it very hard, the pain in your neck will go. I said, you can't be serious because I take combi flam and put move and everything and still the pain doesn't go. So he says, miss, you try it. There's a spot just below your thumb. You press and see. And sure enough, I, when I pressed a particular spot, not every spot, but a particular spot, it hurt like as if there was a needle in my thumb. And I went on pressing it and I woke up the next morning and my neck pain was gone. I don't know if you've heard of acupressure, but there are acupressure points on our hands and on our feet. And when we, there is a different spot for each part of our body and for the neck is somewhere, next time you have a problem in your neck, you can do that too. You know, find a spot on your neck, on your hand and uh, the pain will be gone. You'll be avoiding the combi flam, you'll avoid the move and the discomfort. So something quite similar happens when we are asked to love our neighbor as ourself. We are asked to love our neighbor as ourself. Something quite similar happens because, you know, uh, when Jesus is telling us to love our neighbor, he wants us to love our neighbor as ourself. So before we examine what it means to love our neighbor, we have to examine what it means to love ourselves. So, oops. you know, loving ourselves is one of the hardest things you can do. The other day in the cell group, I, as an icebreaker, I asked our cell members, I said, tell one thing that you like about yourself and one thing that you don't like about yourself. And everybody was so quick to say, oh, I can tell you what I don't like about myself. But liking myself, that's very difficult. You're asking something good about me, I can't tell you. So uh, we, before we learn to love our neighbor, we have to learn to love ourselves. You know, I've shared this before, but in case I, you haven't heard me saying it, I grew up as an only child and I had a very strict and a very stern father and he had very high standards of behavior and high standards of everything and I could never measure up. So I grew up, though I was an only child, I grew up hating myself. So much so that if I had to look in a mirror, you know, if normally when people look at a mirror in the lift, they'll, you know, straighten their hair, mirror, people try to, you know, smoothen their hair. I would turn away. I would actually turn away. And as a result, I was a very unhappy child. 
and I grew up and I continued to be a very unhappy teenager and hardly had any friends and I used to wonder why I couldn't ever make friends until I became a believer and we moved to Hong Kong and a very dear friend of mine who actually mentored me and discipled me, she said, you know, you don't have friends because you, haven't, you don't love yourself. And you have to learn to love yourself first. And only when you learn to love yourself, that can you love others. Because there is an empty vacuum inside you where you are not even loving yourself or doing things for your own good. And so you, that you cannot even pour out the love to others. And she gave me a set of Bible verses which showed me how much God loves me in spite of all my faults and that I could love myself. And she says, put it up near the mirror where you brush your hair and read that verse, set of verses every day. And she actually trained me to learn to love myself a little bit. Because, you know, when you don't love yourself, there is no way that you can love others. So is loving ourselves bad? I don't think so. Because uh, loving ourselves is a measure of how much we love others. So, from the love that we have for ourselves, we will understand what it means to love others. So, a very key thing in loving your neighbor is first step, learn to love yourself. And one of the primary ways that we can express love for ourselves is when you feel hungry, you go and get some food. If you feel cold, you wear something warm. If you're in pain, like me, you take some medicine. Or if you're in some kind of trouble, you try to sort out the situation so that you're not in that trouble anymore. So all in all, you're doing things to care for yourselves. And that is a way of expressing love for yourselves. You know, but our love for our neighbor is not only just a result. There's a related effect. Our love for our neighbor is a measure of our love for God. So first, you learn to love yourself. When you learn to love yourself, you can understand how to love others. And the measure of your love for others is a measure of our love for God. And that is how we demonstrate our love for God. The commandment said, you will love the Lord. First commandment was, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your mind, with all your soul, everything, and your neighbor as yourself. Yes, experiencing God, knowing about Him, reaching out, listening to God, hearing from God, these are all fuel for the fire. Yes, but our love for, other, uh, love for God always has an outworking. Our outworking is a practical expression and that is our love for others. So in the parable of the Good Samaritan, a lawyer asks Jesus, sorry, so who is our neighbor? We talked about loving our neighbor. A neighbor is not just somebody who lives near you. A neighbor is not just somebody sitting on the chair beside you. But a neighbor is any person who is in need and not just your immediate neighbor. Any person who is in need. Very important. When we work in an office, the staff in our office are all our neighbors. You travel by train, people sitting you on, on the train next to you are your neighbors. People sitting in the bus next to you are your neighbors. So whoever is there around you and whoever is in need is a neighbor. And many times we develop biases. We choose, we are selective who our neighbor is. If the person is not of the same education level as us, we think, oh, you know, we are not equal and we don't consider them our neighbors. Or if they look different, they are dressed different. If they are behaving differently, you go into a cafe coffee day and you have a young set of teenagers who come in with pierced bodies, tattooed hands and, you know, really short clothes, revealing clothes. And you think, they're different. I'm not like that. And automatically you start building a wall. This is not my neighbor. 
a new, uh, you know, you go into a train and there is a bhajan mandali group and they are making lots of noise and you are getting disturbed and you think, that is not my neighbor, I'm shutting off. I don't want to have anything to do with them. Or you find that somebody comes from a different area, either, you know, a different part of the country or a different part of the city. Maybe they live in slums. Maybe they're very rich and live in duple apartments and you think, oh, they can't be my neighbor. So we ourselves automatically begin to create walls as to who our neighbor is and who is not. Even as you go out from here, even as we all go out from here, there may be somebody we just avoid saying hello to. We are automatically creating those walls. Right here and all of us. So let's not do that. Let's not, you know, because when we are treated like that, have you had anyone treating you, you know, shutting you out? Maybe in your office. Maybe when you decided not to join in with the rest to go for a party, you know, they just shut you out and don't call you anymore. It impacts us quite negatively when we shut people off because, you know, there's every chance that we might be treated like that. So love that is practical and a tangible experience of God will always lead us to people. But you know, the minute you come across people, you realize that they have some problem or the other. There's some mess in their life or the other. And you think, am I going to deal with all this? You know, that's why in a city like Bombay, if there is somebody who's met with an accident on the road, and if there's somebody on the railway track, I mean, you just don't want to have anything to do with it because how can I cope with all that? That is my neighbor in need, but how can I cope with all that? So if there's a messy person in front of you, and they irritate you, and they've got all kinds of things going on in, you, in their life, how much of a neighbor will we be? What we will do is we will manifest the level of maturity of love of God that we carry. If we are impatient, we don't have much love because love is patient. If we are unkind, we don't have much love because love is kind. If we are harsh, then don't have much love because love is gentle. So the check mark for our spiritual level is the kind of people that the neighbor that God puts in front of us. And what it does when God puts somebody in need in front of us, what it does, it is brings a sense of responsibility that we don't just talk and engage with God, but we begin to engage with people. The bottom line to show our spirituality, whatever level of spirituality you have, the bottom line is gentleness, kindness, forgiveness, mercy and grace for others. You know, uh, we had, our son lives in the United States and uh, we, when we were there, once we had the good fortune of being able to worship at the Vineyard Church of Columbus. Let me tell you that the congregation there is 20,000 people. 20,000. On a weekend, they have a service on Friday evening, Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening, and several on Sunday, and still all the people are not covered. And they have 700 meetings in the church premises during the week. And do you know what we saw there? We saw guys, hell's angels, motorbike fellows with tattoos on their arms. They come to church. Women with, you know, hardly any clothes. I mean, looking absolutely like they were going for a party, coming to the church. You have people who are brought off the street, who are living on the streets, you know, tangled hair, dreadlocks. They were there. And there was no judgment. Everybody was, we watched, we stood, you know, as we were having a cup of coffee before the service, we saw that each and every person was welcomed with the same love, with the same acceptance. No wonder their congregation is 20,000. They have special groups for women who are dieting. They'll have a Bible study specially for them. For single mothers, they'll have a special Bible study group for them. 
for people who are trying to get off smoking and alcohol, they'll have a special group for them. They have those people also. A congregation can only grow when we are outward looking and when we will engage with people. You know, we were in Hong Kong in, uh, from 1987 to 1993 and I was a teacher in an Anglo-Chinese school. I was a class teacher of an equivalent of ninth standard. All Chinese girls, it was a convent. And uh, one of the girls who used to sit right in front, she used to be sleeping on her hand most of the time. I used to teach them English. She used to be sleeping on her hand most of the time and her hand was sticking out just below my table. And the first way I noticed her was that she had all rash on her body. Her name was Gallery. Gallery, like the balcony, her name was Gallery. Chinese people have some unusual names, so she was Gallery Chan. And, you know, I said, Gallery, what is this infection? What is this? She's, in her broken English, she told me about the rash, that she didn't have the money to go to the doctor. And then, as I got talking to her, she told me that her mother was a gambling madam, you know, who controlled the gambling then. Her brother was in the mafia triads. Her sister was a street walker. And she didn't have a father. So when she went home, all these other people used to be at their various businesses of gambling, street walking, whatever, you know, mafia work. And she would have nothing in the fridge. You know, some uh, open tin would be there. And she would eat whatever was there. So her skin was very bad. So. I began to talk to her beyond the class time. I began to talk to her and she really responded. She actually took initiative, went to the doctor and she got her skin treated. And you know, before I came to know her, I heard that she would do everything to defy the nuns. If the nun said your uniform has to be up to the knee, her uniform was three inches above the knee. If the nun said you have to have your hair below the ears, her hair was cut really short, boy cut, and they would make her wear a black woolen cap. But the time that I started talking to her and, you know, being her sort of listening ear, she kept out of trouble. She kept out of trouble. She didn't get caught with the nuns. And she really began to study in the class, not just sleep. And then what happened was I changed jobs. I went to a school which was a British school. Uh, this was in Kowloon. I went to a school which was in Hong Kong side. And I would get, you know, I would ask my uh, fellow teachers how she was doing. And she was caught smoking in the toilet again. And she was, again, she had cut her hair too short. And six months later, I get a phone call from one of my teachers that gallery had jumped from the 23rd floor of the building. When Daryl and I went for her funeral, there was nothing left. You know, they just had a small box. And that really affected me a lot. And soon after that, we moved to India. And I began to teach here in a school. And uh, once I got to know the children, I was a class teacher of the fifth standard children. There was a little boy, 10 year old boy, who came to me and says, Miss, Miss, I want to die. And, you know, I, again, those ringing sounds of gallery jumping uh, came to my ears and, and I said, no, something has to be done. Something has to be done about this. So I called for his father and I learned that his mother had died when she gave birth to his sister five years prior to that. So there was just this man and his two children, boy and a girl. Man was working in a multinational company here. Oh, sorry, a, a big company. And so I told him, I said, you know, I want to take your son home every day. He says, but why? Why would you want to do that? I said, no, I think I need to put some systems into him. And I want to make sure that he studies well. I didn't tell him about wanting to die. And then he says, but I can't afford it. I said, I don't want any money from you. I don't want anything from you. I'll just take him home with me every single day. So after school, this 10-year-old boy would sit in the car. I had a little Maruti car. 
we would drive home and he would be sitting next to me. One day at the traffic signal near our house, he tells me, he says, Miss, I want to die. My birth, this is August 93. Uh, I, it's my birthday on 25th of September. When uh, my birthday is over, I want to die. So I said, but why do you say you want to die? He says, I'm very bad. I said, the very fact that you realize that you're bad shows that you're becoming good because you're realizing that you're bad. He says, no, miss, I'm very bad. I said, okay, never mind. At least for now, you come to my house, and then we'll see. So he would come to our house. He had to wash his hands. He, could, he would eat two toast. He would drink a bottle of energy. He had never anything in his pencil box. His buttons were always broken. You know, his shirt buttons were always broken. And, you know, slowly but surely, he got into the system of doing things regularly. He got into the system of, he knew that as soon as he came, he had to wash his hands and, you know, follow the routine. Then his books started coming. Then we started seeing some work being done. And six months down the line, we were same signal. He says, you know, miss, it's good to be alive. <laughs> and I was so happy. Today, he's 30 years old. And his father has had a paralytic stroke. And he's looking after his father. To tell you in between, the next two years I was his class teacher and he stayed out of trouble. And, uh, you know, this word in the staff room used to go on. You know how teachers are. They would spread because he was so naughty. He was always in trouble. They told me all kinds of things. You know, but he's like this, he's like that. I said, doesn't matter. It's all right. Then after two years, I went as a principal of another school. During the three years that I was away, he stole from the school canteen. He ran away. We had to go to Gamdevi police station also to find out where he was. He had gone to one Chinese stall fellow at Nariman Point and said, I want to work for you. You know, that kind of thing he did. And then, to his good fortune, I went back to that school as school principal when he was in the 10th. And he did his 10th properly. He didn't bunk a single class. He passed his ICSC, 59%. He did his BCom after that. Today he's a yoga instructor. He teaches yoga. He's calmed down completely. And a life changed. A life changed because I chose to engage with him. If I had gone by what the other teachers told me, he could have been just another naughty kid in my class. But I chose to engage with him and that's where the difference came. So, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but in actions and in truth. Jesus did this. He connected with people. He demonstrated acceptance of people. And he discovered their needs by listening to them and by interacting them. And he wants us to the, do the same thing. But we can't do it unless we engage with people. You'll find that our experiences with God are vitally connected to our experiences with people, how we interact and how we work with people. And the key in all this is seeing someone in need. Now, there are more needs than we can minister to. Even Jesus didn't minister to all the needs. But what happens most of the time is we see someone in need and we say, someone ought to do something about that. Yes, someone ought to do something about that. And that someone who ought to do something about that is you and me. Why? Because we have seen the need. There's always something that we can do. What we are required to do is not shut up our heart. 
when you see a person in need. The problem is we watch so much of TV, so much of violence, you know, the real stuff happening, whether it's in Egypt or in Syria, people are being killed, that we begin to look upon death and suffering and violence with a detached heart. We create a wall. We see so much of violence that we, it actually overflows into our life and we don't really feel anything anymore. But the love that God is looking for is more than just lifting our hands in worship. It actually overflows to where you see somebody in need and you take the initiative to connect with them and help them. God wants to ensure that we are at the ground level and we don't just talk, we actually do something to change the lives of those around us. Jesus was criticized because he ate with all the wrong people. He moved around with sinners and prostitutes. But Jesus mixed with them because he came to show the love of God, the heart of God. Isn't that fantastic? Love takes the initiative to do something. Let's look at a very you know, commonly known parable that we have. Let's read through it and look at this parable. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked, and who's my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hand of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. The lawyer said, you love the Lord, your God, with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Do this. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked, who is my neighbor? And notice what Jesus said. And he said, who is a neighbor? Which of these three th do you think was a neighbor? He turned the question around and asked, who is a neighbor? What counts is, are you a neighbor? Am I a neighbor to those around us? What is your role? What is my role in the story of the Good Samaritan? Are you, am I a good neighbor? So, let's look at what the role of a neighbor is. A neighbor, first of all, gets involved. A neighbor engages with people and their needs. A neighbor does something. I'm sure that the man who was traveling, the traveler who got attacked by the robbers, he didn't expect this kind of thing happening in his life. We don't expect it either. When somebody is traveling, somebody mugs you, you don't expect it to happen. You think it will happen to somebody else. Maybe in our class, we have somebody who's had a kind of a problem. 
maybe our teachers, maybe our colleagues in the office. Somebody's had an experience like that. The Bible tells us that such people are wounded. Wounded, the other word is trauma. People undergo all kinds of trauma, painful experiences, divorces, addictions, all kinds of things. Everywhere we go, there are people like this. Now look at what the priest and the Levite did. The priest just crossed to the other side. He did not want to get involved. Not that he didn't see the problem, not that he didn't see the need. He just didn't want to get involved. Look at what the Levite did. He went there, he looked at him, he says, oh, what a mess, and went back onto the other side. He shut up his heart and left him as well. Jesus brought this out to show us what religion is like. Religion does not have a heart for people. Religion shuts up the heart, does not want to get involved. God calls us into an intimate relationship with him and out of that should flow the love of God to touch people. Religion causes the world to be divided into those who are acceptable and those who are not acceptable. There's a judging attitude, a superior attitude. We are not to be like that. We are called to be something different. Then he talks about the Samaritan. You know, God can raise up anyone to help someone. God is more than able to help to find anyone who is willing. And if we want to be in the line of God's work, then we need to be willing and not shut up our hearts. We have to be willing to engage with the needs of people. You can't just have an experience of worship and without actually catching the heart of God, which is to meet people. And look what the Samaritan did. He put him uh, put oil and wine. He ministered to him. He ministered to him, gave him dinari. So God's heart is like we be like that Samaritan. So what are we called to do by God? First of all, we are called to be his ambassador and his representative. If you open up your heart, you will find that the God brings to you people who are battered and who've got issues. And if you will actually engage with them, you can reach out to them. But if you shut your heart and just talk about yourself, you'll miss the opportunities. The second thing that God wants us to do is show his heart and his compassion. The minute you begin to feel that compassion, God will do something. God will bring about some ideas, some thoughts of what you can do. Engage and enter the world of unsaved people. Now, how does one do that? You have to understand the world is different from the life that we have in the church. We have to get rid of the religious clutter, our jargon. Just an example, if you're talking to people, Instead of saying, oh, I'm blessed, you can say, I'm happy. If you're saying, I was born again, you can say, I was given a fresh new start. If you say, I want to say, I was saved, you're sharing with somebody, you can say, my life changed at that moment. Jesus is my Lord. He's our manager, our CEO. I repent, I repented. I changed my mind. I had sinned. I knew I had messed up. All are sinners. Nobody's perfect. We all make mistakes. I felt convicted. I realized. Simple words. The Holy Ghost, God's Spirit. You know, many times we put people off because of this jargon. We want to share with people, but we put them off because of the jargon. So, let's know that when we go out into the world, we're going to face people who are different from us. They are doing crazy things. You'll have to accept that in the world there are crazy things going on. We need to understand where that's coming from. And the church really needs to change the way it looks when it goes outside. When it looks at people, when it, you know, the people have the same problems. It's just that the wrapping is different. It just requires a measure of conversational ability 
and skill to listen and a heart to be non-judgmental and reach out. The next thing is to connect and identify with people what their needs are. And whatever you can do, you can pray for them or you can you know, share something from the word of God. Whatever level of ministry you can do, bring it at their level, something simple. And most importantly, we need to release resources. God has provided us with so much. He's our provider and he continues to give us. But we have to be open. You see what that man, the Samaritan did. He took him and he put him on his own animal, took him to the inn, looked after him. We can bring people to the church. We can do whatever we can. We can get the help of our friends around us. But we have to follow up. We have to make sure that we care about those people. And if necessary, we, if we are investing in some kind of program or any kind of service, then we can release some resources. I want us to think about the commitment that we want to make this morning to be more like the Samaritan, to be more showing the heart of God. And I'd like us all to read this out together. You have it on your lecture notes. Go home, read about it, think about it, and let's make this commitment. Let's read it together at the count of three. One, two, three. Father, I thank you for the call on my life. I will do my best to arise and engage with people in different ways and at different levels and broken people will be restored. I choose to let your love and compassion flow through me to others.